My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Embers to Excellence, a podcast that explores the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. We discuss the triumphs and failures that have shaped our lives and our leadership philosophies. I've found that it isn't whether we fail that defines us, but when we do fail, how we respond. Leaders dust off the ashes and use their failures as fuel to work harder and as lessons to come back wiser and stronger, more resilient, more determined, and more committed to excellence. Today, I am speaking with Nate Palmer. He is the best-selling author of The Million Dollar Body Method and Passport Fitness. Nate is a fitness and nutrition expert, a coach, speaker, and writer who believes that being in incredible shape gives a massive advantage in business focus and relationships. Nate helps business owners and entrepreneurs improve their physique, finances, and family time using fitness and nutrition as force multipliers. Today, we're going to talk to Nate about his books and really his passion. And uh, I'd like to start off first by, well, welcoming you, Nate. And then uh, uh, when we get into the conversation, if we could start off with where you were born and raised and really give us oh, a all little, the way back, huh? Yeah. Yeah. A little, little sense of who you are, what, what right. kind of events have shaped you and, and who you are. Say when. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm really excited to, to be here. Um, and if you want to go all the way back, I was born and raised in Phoenix, uh, which is where I'm currently living with my wife uh, and two kids. I got a three-year-old and a seven-month-old. And, um, but I really feel like, you know, this conversation probably starts, like, let me, I'll just skip forward out of like the bulk of like, you know, you know, be like child rearing phase and, and get into like, one of the things I think was like integral and in shaping me to get into fitness. I think a lot of guys get into it because they're into martial arts, they play football or something like that. And that was never it for me. I told my mom that I wanted to do karate. Um, karate kid was like big, you know, I was growing up, you know, like that gives you any indication of like, you know, grow up in the eighties and nineties. And she was like, cool, cool, cool. Uh, so karate, how about instead of that, we can do clogging. Do you know what clogging is Dave? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so you, so you understand, you're picking up what I'm putting down. I'm a, yeah. like picture this. I'm like, a, I'm 11, 12 year old boy. And I want to do karate. And my mom's like, how about dancing, but not like tap dancing, like the worst kind of that. So did that for about a year. Um, well, it's so, a, like, sports in, a never sense, really in a sense, it's, uh, you know, something that will help you defend yourself you could kick your clogs off at in a, a would-be attacker or something like that that's a monster stretch dave but i'll yeah i'll go with that <laughs> <laughs> no i would i don't think that there's a sport or a physical activity that's less helpful in defending yourself like even badminton probably would be more helpful than than clogging but yeah. so, so but like, going, like going back to that like i uh i was I'm like kind of like 12, 12 years old or something like that. I'm at home. My mom is taking my, my sisters to drop them up at school and someone breaks into the house while I'm there by myself. And so like, I just started clogging for him and like, it didn't scare him away. I'm just kidding. That didn't happen. <laughs> but what I did is I grabbed a, a steak knife out of the knife block and I ran into my bedroom and I locked the door. This little like beep, little lock. And I hid under the bed with a steak knife. And I remember hearing him come down the hallway and pound on my door. And I was just like losing my shit. I was like freaking out. It was super, super scary. Right. And so at that point, what I remember feeling was like, I, I don't want to ever like feel this sense of powerlessness again. I don't want to ever have, have anyone take my autonomy away or leave me feeling in this way. And I was like, okay, well, I'm 12. So what does that mean? I'm like, well, I need a lot of big muscles. So people, so people are scared of me and I'm intimidating. And then I also need a lot of knives. So that's kind of became like the, the goal at that time, probably more focused on knives than on muscles. So I've always kind of had a, like a relationship with fitness and stuff, but mostly it was like this fear-based response, running away from like feeling powerless, feeling not good enough, feeling scared and trying to become a, a more intimidating version of my previous self. So that's kind of where, that's kind of where it all started. That's where it kicked off. 
did you immediately start studying fitness and and going to the gym uh i think i was doing push-ups like like on a more regular basis but no i wasn't like going to the gym or studying fitness i was still like barely navigating like middle school and high school and like wondering if girls liked me hint they did not and so I, I didn't really get into like the study of fitness until about until kind of college so like late high school is kind of when google started to really ramp up and you could actually search for things and find answers so um like kind of college level is like i was rather than i was doing my degree in business from university of arizona and rather than like diving all into that, I just didn't really love it. So what I spent my time doing was just reading archives of like men's health and T nation and breaking muscle and all these sites that I thought were some of the best, the best like literature and education in the world at the time on fitness, on nutrition, on health in general. And I was obsessed. I read through like thousands of articles, like decades of, of archives of these things, just immersing myself as much as I possibly could. And then I graduated uh, college into just the glorious job market of 2008. So, you know, if you've got any Gen Zers listening to this, then, uh, yeah. uh, then that was, there was actually no jobs. There was no job, especially for, for a, like a recently graduated college student. So I was like, great, well, I'll get a job doing personal training until I figure out what I want to do with my life. And I really loved it. And I kind of like, I just kind of, you know, fell in love with the process, fell in love with people, helping people get results, that sort of thing. Up until um, like a year later, I was like, I like this so much. I'm going to quit and go get a job in an office so I can be an adult, do a grown-up job. And about, I mean, day one, I went to day one at this office. It was kind of like inside sales. It was helping people like enroll for, enroll for college. It was Kaplan University. It was a, a for-profit university. And um, day one, I was like, this is the worst. This is absolutely the worst possible way I can think of spending my time. Uh, so I had a couple of mentors at the time and one of them told me like, listen, you need to get out of there so you don't kill yourself and start your own business, start open, open up a gym yourself. So thankfully I listened to him, started my own gym in Phoenix and it was awesome. Loved it, built it up over time, had some great clients there. It was fantastic. Learned a lot, had a great couple of great mentors in that space. And so I was like, this is so awesome. So I quit that job. My wife and I moved to Seattle without jobs or without really knowing anyone or, or where we were going or anything like that. And um, fell into a job up there working at an incredible gym called Pro Sports Club. It was just like phenomenal. They had 150 trainers. This place is like 500,000 square feet, like seven different pool, like three different basketball courts with the court from the like the 1997 Seattle Supersonics Championship, um, med spa, actual spa, auto spa, florist, like you name it. This gym had everything. It was, it was amazing. Um, so I worked there for a couple of years and I was like, this is so great. So we quit, we both quit our jobs, my wife and I sold all of our stuff and then, uh, moved down to South America for a bit. And so we were down there for about a year, a little over. And at that point I wanted to, to continue working with clients. So I transitioned my business to being entirely online in about 2015. So, which comes with its own set of challenges and learning experiences. So at that point, I was basically delivering workouts to clients on an Excel spreadsheet. And you'd be surprised at this day, but people were just not getting results or really you know, doing my workouts. So I was like, you know what I need to do here? Get videos. So I took all my, all my exercises and turned them into like a 400 exercise video library and started sending out Excel spreadsheets, except for now these ones were linked to videos on YouTube. And weirdly enough, people still weren't getting results, Dave. It was crazy. Like I was like, well, you guys don't get videos? Like what's up with that? So like, um, fast forward to about 20, like late 2016, my wife and I get back to Arizona, kind of just figuring out what we want to do. And, um, I start like diving into like the kind of the science of results. Why do some people succeed and what side people, some people don't in terms of their fitness and their health. Why are some people stuck in this loop where they're up and down, up and down, up and down all the time. What are the habits? What are like the lifestyles? What are those nutrition pieces that we're missing here? And I believe I stumbled into something that was like absolutely incredible. A framework that I think is phenomenal for entrepreneurs, for business owners, busy dads, it just seems to be, just seems to really click for them. And so I wrote it up into a book called the million dollar body method. You can uh, grab that on Amazon if you wanted to. Um, I think the Kindle version is like a buck or two. And I like, I feel like a lot of coaches, when they write a book, it's like, Hey, it's, it's a glorified sales letter. It's like, Hey, read this book, but no secrets in here. All the secrets in my, in my program. And by the way, my program is $10,000. So I did not do that. I uh, wrote the book. It's all, it's all there because who knows where I'm going to be in five, 10 years. And I'd like to still this be a standalone like piece that can help people get some, some really great results. 
Awesome. And that's my yeah. life story. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Thanks yeah. for TED Talk. <laughs> the your book, Passport Fitness. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah, so thanks for asking. Um, so this is a book I wrote basically when we got back. So this came out in 2017, 2018, maybe. Um, it was based on uh, my wife and I's travels through South America and how to stay in shape if you're a busy professional, you're on the road a lot. So we came up with a lot of great strategies for doing this because, you know, we were, we were like going from here to there. We're doing all sorts of stuff, like never in the same place, never had access to a gym. We worked on a boat in the Panama Canal, giving tours for like six months. We worked on a pig farm in Ecuador. Uh, we worked at like an after school program in Peru. You know, we skied in Chile. We did like we posted up in Argentina and worked for, for a month down there. So like we we're all over the place, staying in all sorts of different locations. And but it's still very important to me for to to train and to eat right. So I wrote up some of those strategies for like the kind of the business traveler, someone who's on the road a lot. And how do you get how do you stay in the shape that you want to stay in? How do you not let travel derail your progress? Um, but this book is a, basically a, a collection of helpful anecdotes, stories about my time traveling and some like tactical tips, essentially. But what I realized from this book is that it wasn't transformative at all. You would read it. You might like it. Maybe you wouldn't like it. I don't know. Um, and you would kind of move on and be like, that was, those are nice things in there. And, but like, it's not going to really change much for you, to be honest. So when I wrote the second book, Million Dollar Body Method, I wanted to make it something that it was actionable. So rather than just like a, a cluster of tips combined into a, like a, with a pretty binding, I wanted something that you could actually like take, hold on to, mark up, follow, go back to utilize like through the course of your life, rather than just being like, that's a nice thing on my shelf. So that was the kind of the purpose of the million dollar body method, which is basically a four week program written to this. We go over the, what, called, what I think of as the seven daily investments. What are the seven things that you need to do on a, on a daily basis to be successful in fitness, to have a ton of energy and to show up big time for your family and for your, like for your tribes and for your trade. Can you share a little bit of uh, what somebody would get out of reading that book and, and uh, I don't know, maybe set the hook, so to speak. Set the hook, really sell, yeah. really sell this one. Yeah. Tune in next time to see the million dollar body <laughs> method. So basically, if you if you're reading this book, Dave, and you know, who knows, maybe I'll send you a copy, you get a chance to check it out. Um, what, what I would hope that you get out of it would be a framework, a recipe, so to speak. And because like, if your if your output, because I always start to think about things in terms of inputs and outputs, I think like we think in Western culture, like, what do I want to eat Cinnabon, therefore, I will eat a Cinnabon. But if, if we start thinking about like, what do I want to feel like? How do I want this meal to treat me? How do I want to do after this meal? Am I, do I need to be up? Do I need to be focused? Do I need to like get a lot of tasks done? In that case, I need to be, I need to think about what I want to eat and make sure that my inputs match my outputs. So in this book, I want to give you a framework for inputs and outputs to give you the ability to have the energy that you need when you need it, to know how to eat in a way that gives you energy, builds you up, allows you to burn more belly fat rather than here's another diet book about weight loss or how to count calories because there's a there's a fair few of those and i don't like i didn't need to write another one but i what i what i wrote here was something that i don't think exists because the focus is on doing being and having more how do you grow how do you improve how do you use fitness and nutrition as force multipliers rather than fitness and nutrition as ways of becoming smaller dropping weight losing pounds be, reducing fat you notice that all those words are focused on decreasing right I think that's what fitness does. It tells us we need to be less. You're not, you're too much and become less. And I don't believe that's true. I think we need to become more. You need to have more energy. You need to show up, show up big. So the, the, the reason the impetus for this book was a client of mine I started working with in 2018, uh, who was a roofer starting a roofing business here in Phoenix. And he was like, Hey, listen, so I got a problem. I'm like, what's your problem? He's like, well, I got to lose 30 pounds. And I'm like, great. I'm a trainer. I can help. He's like, yeah, but I, I'm not training. I'm not going to do any sort of training. I was like, okay. He's like, I'm just too busy. I'm like, okay. Oh, he's like, also, I am dead tired every single night. And he's like, I drink three bang energy drinks a day. And I'm like, all right, okay. And he's like, so what I need from you is a nutrition plan, a meal plan, something that I can eat so I don't feel like I have to go sit on the couch for 30 minutes and watch ESPN before I can engage with my kids at night. I was like, all right. He's like, and by the way, I'm going to eat out. I'm going to eat fast food five times per week. Deal with it. Figure it out. I was like, okay, damn. All right. So 
came up with a program that was going to like, that I thought could really fit his lifestyle, being busy, eating out, but still wanting the benefits of energy. So teaching his body essentially how to use stored fat for energy without having to go on some ridiculous keto diet where you're putting butter in your coffee or some nonsense like that. So fast forward like two months, he comes back and he's like, man, this diet, is, it's incredible. It's perfect for me. I'm, I feel energized all day long. I am like, when I get home, I have a ton of energy and enthusiasm for my kids. I'm doing great work. My business is growing. And I'm like, that is so exciting, man. Like, congratulations. He goes, oh yeah, by the way, I lost 22 pounds in the last two months. And I was like, okay, well, we, we might've just did something here. So without <laughs> exercise, with a, a job where he's working 10 to 14 hours a day with four kids at home, with a brand new business, this guy still ate out five times per week and lost 22 pounds while building up his energy. I was like, that is something that we need to talk more about. So took all those strategies, built them into a, like a, a system called them the seven daily investments. Cause most of my clients, they they'll, they'll do an investment before they'll invest in their own health. They'll, you know, buy crypto or whatever. So I wanted to make, make sure that the, it was like, it was a very clear line. It was a clear parallel between like you invest with your health here and your financial and physical success is on the other side of that. So if you buy now <laughs> and you'll receive access to all seven daily investments, as well as, I don't know, kind of a nice matte black cover. Someone's like, <laughs> I don't like that cover. It looks like a business book. And I was like, good. Number one, not for you. Number two, that's what I wanted. So if I'm going to be training for uh, a race, uh, particularly like, you know, there's the Tough mutter, there's the Spartan races. If I'm going to train to compete in one of these events how would reading your book benefit me and and my training regimen great question it definitely would not no nope it's not built for that it's built for it's built for like busy entrepreneurs and business owners and i want to make that distinction super clear because I feel like there's a lot of books out there for counting macros that are specifically for weight loss. There's a lot of books that are like, Hey, here's like, like intermittent, a book on intermittent fasting. Hey, here's a book on muscle building. And so this book is not for like, like triathletes or Ironmans or people who are training for like a specific event. If you're trying to be a bodybuilder and put on as much muscle as possible, it's not going to help out that much. The one thing that you might be able to glean from it is kind of like the inputs versus outputs, but like the way training works for a race like that, where you're going to be spending a lot of energy, you're going to be out, like really putting in like, like hours on, like on in mileage and also in like, kind of like the events, like doing a lot of burpees and things like that. Cause I know that's a penalty for not, for not like finishing or, or skipping a, skipping an obstacle or missing an obstacle. So it's not like, it's not really built as like a, like a physical performance eating. It's more built as a mental performance eating or energetic performance eating. And I think that like for most of my clients, that's kind of what, like what they're looking for, you know, working out is like something that happens like three or four times a week, it's 30, 45, 60 minutes. It's really low key. So if you're training for something big, it's not that helpful to be honest with you. I'm not, uh, really an athlete. So typically what I do is I spend a lot of time, uh, writing and recording podcast episodes. And as you can imagine, it's yeah you know, that's not where i burn most of my calories so that isn't uh, a far cry from what a lot of busy professionals do is they sit behind a desk and uh focus right yeah, focus and and i am familiar with that feeling of like just i'm exhausted and i really haven't done anything <laughs> so yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of what you teach in your book would benefit me in, in that sense. Oh yeah. Now you're speaking my language. Now it's like, okay, how do I get amped up for a podcast, but also have enough focus and energy left to do the editing, the nitty gritty, cross those things off my to-do list in the afternoon after recording. Is that, is like, is that a little bit more kind of what you're talking about? Because that's yeah. my speed. Yeah, Absolutely. Perfect. Yeah. So like, I think for what you're talking about with that, especially like a lot of busy professionals, you sit at a desk a lot, you're trying to write contracts. If you're the type of person who would rather sign a new client than hit the gym, like that's who this book is for. So if you'd rather record a new, a new podcast episode, than go for a run, like you would like this book because 
I want to tell you about how to show up big time, no matter what that thing is, whether that's deep work where you're writing, you're scheduling some stuff, you're like, you're figuring out what you want to talk about the flow of your podcast. Or if it's like those things in the afternoon where you're like, man, I got 15 things on my to-do list. Like, what can I check off? Or when it's like, when you get home and like your kids are like, dad, and you're like, I'm so tired. Like, how do you avoid those things? And there's a couple of different strategies in the book, but they're also so, so simple. And they re- so much revolve around our inputs. Basically, what are you eating in the morning? Because morning time, I think is what, what kills so many business owners and entrepreneurs because we're setting ourselves up for a day of blood sugar spikes, like sugar cravings, and those little patches of tiredness. Like, you know, like, like that 1030, two o'clock, five o'clock where you're like, why am I tired? I have not done anything at all today. And you just, but you're just like feeling exhausted, but if you're having the wrong breakfast. Like that's just inevitable because our energy all day long is like up and down, up and down, up and down. So what I want to teach people is how to get their energy to go like this. And if you can't see that I'm kind of doing like this big sloping, like up and down, like it looks like a, like a, a rolling hill. Cause that's what we want our, our energy and our blood sugar to do all day is to kind of slowly come up and slowly come back down. That way we're not getting cravings, energy spikes, tiredness, at like middle of the day. Those things are just distractions. How does that play into, you know, I, I know that there's listeners that have diabetes that, um, you know, either they manage it with, with their diet or with insulin, if they're insulin dependent. Now, is it, is your regimen, is it strict in the sense that you kind of lay out the, the meal plans or is it more like you need this much, uh, protein, this much, uh, complex carbohydrates, that kind of thing, or I'm, I'm trying to get a feel for what, what your book talks about. Let's just dive in. Let me just, let me just lay it out kind of what breakfast, lunch, and dinner look like, because it's a little different from what a lot of people talk about in terms of like, Hey, you need to count your carbohydrates or here's how many, like, here's what like a, a serving looks like in terms of like your palm or whatever. And I don't do any of that because what I, what most of my clients have told me is that I will not track my macros. I will not use my fitness pal. I will not use lose it. I will not track and that you cannot make me. And so I was like, okay, no problem. We can figure it out. And so of course, like as people get a little bit more into the program, we can kind of tighten things and we can get some tracking going on. But basically the format is simple. This book dictates a 28 day hard reset. What I think of as phase one, I think of fat loss in three phases. Phase one, hard reset, much more, less, much more structured. Uh, Phase two is a little bit more like, long-term fat loss. We pull away from the structure a little bit. We work in foods that you like, that way you're not feeling deprived and something that's just, we build something sustainable in phase two. Phase three is once we hit a specific, I think of it as a waist tight ratio, how about how good your body does with insulin and carbohydrates, then we can start working on muscle metabolism. So most people don't get like, most people I feel like, and this is, a, this is not the question you asked at all, but I'm gonna just say, answer it. <laughs> most people when they get to the like their end goal they're like oh, i lost the weight i put on the dress i you know i got i'm getting married whatever it is they just stop you know and they kind of they're eventually their weight comes back up and that's when we get these yo-yos so i like to think of uh, the phase three as like what do you do after you hit your hit your fat loss goals you're you ate as low or as lean as you want to get to what's next so this book is all about phase one. It's a pretty hard reset. It's something you can always turn back to. I would equate it to more of like a whole 30 than a like than like a macro tracking diet. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So basically like what I want to do is I want to lay out like, so my seven daily investments, three of them are breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so for breakfast, I want to teach people about the framework or the formula to have a ton of energy and feel good all day. And I'll give it to you. It's really simple. It's high protein and fat in the morning is going to do that for you. Most people that I deal with are insulin resistant, which means that they body, their bodies do not use insulin and carbohydrates effectively. And there's two easy ways to figure or three, I guess, three easy ways to figure out if you're insulin resistant or not. Number one, go to the doctor, have a test done. They're generally expensive. Number two, take a measurement at your belly button, divide that by your height. If that number is above 0.47, then you are insulin resistant. And there's like a sliding scale, right? And then like number three, if you're like, I don't know about, I don't know about that. I don't have a measuring tape, grab your belly. Like, is it 
Is it substantial? Can you get your hands on it? Then you probably have insulin resistance. It's really dictated a lot by visceral fat and belly fat. So if you can, if you feel like, oh man, I got belly fat, I got love handles, chances are you are insulin resistant and your body is not, never going to use carbohydrates correctly. So especially you start off in the morning, Dave, and you're like, let me have something healthy. Let me have oatmeal. Let me have a banana. Still spikes your blood sugar up too high. Your insulin comes to meet it, goes a little higher. Blood sugar goes back down, but you still got some insulin in your system. So your body sends you a signal to your brain, 1030. It's like, what's up? Let's get some food. And instead of having like six blueberries, like we should, we have like a donut or like, if we're being good, like I have a half a donut blood sugar back up, insulin goes to meet it back down. So now all day we're doing this thing where we're playing catch up. Whereas what we want to do is have that go up, come down and back down. Everything always in like in homeostasis. So having a high protein, high fat breakfast is going to do that for you. It's going to give you a very slow release of blood sugar. It's going to help you feel really good. It's going to eliminate cravings. It's going to push you out to like 12, 12, 30, one o'clock before you start getting hungry again for lunch, which is what we want because snacking is really the bane of an entrepreneur's existence. A lot of us think like, oh, let me have a high energy snack. Let me have a little sugar, get my brain going. But really that's killing us. Number one, sugar is obviously not healthy for us. But number two, we put, every time we put something into our stomach, we're now going to digest that food. So it's pulling blood from our extremities, our hands and our legs and our brain to digest that food. So we're never going to be as sharp or as functional or as on as we need to be if we're just coming off a big meal, right? Like think about after Thanksgiving, do you want to go record a podcast? Do you want to get on with like a really, like a really awesome guest? Like not me, but like someone like really great. No, absolutely not. Like most of us want to sit down on the couch and watch like the Detroit lions get crushed. You know, like that's what, that's what I'm gunning for on Thanksgiving because I'm so stuffed. I'm so tired. I'm so lethargic. So if you want to, you want to do more, you got to eat less. And if you want to eat less, you got to stop having those cravings and you want to stop having those cravings. You got to eat the right foods at mealtimes. So that's why breakfast, high proteins, high, high fats, lunchtime, high proteins, high veg. And then at dinner time, this is not a keto diet. This is not a low carb diet. This is a, this is a, like a great diet for energy. Okay. So for at dinner time, then we're having carbs, proteins, and vegetables. And the reason we have carbs at nighttime is because that same reason as you don't want to get a Chipotle burrito at two o'clock, it's going to make you tired. You're going to want to crawl under your desk and get a nap in. But in the evening, that's when you want to shift into that rest and digest state or parasympathetic nervous system dominance. So we want to use our inputs to dictate our outputs. Outputs in the evening should be rest and digest. So we're going to crank up the carbohydrates and turn, turn that up. And then once you get into the habit here, once you spend a week or so doing this, Dave, at that point, your body's going to be more responsive. It's going to understand more of what it needs. And it's going to stop sending you false signals as much to your brain. It's like, hey, we're hungry for some Skittles. You're like, the hell you are, you know, like we're, you're going to have more accurate, uh, like I like ideas about what you should be eating, which is really important because, you know, a lot of people are like, well, how, what's my portion size? And I'm like, I'm not really going to like tell you, you can like, just, just eat a small amount. If you want to have more, have more, but our goal is to let our body inform the, like inform the process. And it, it's, it's a radical shift for a lot of people, but it's, but it can be so helpful if, if you're the right type of person looking for more rather than how do I become less. One of the things that I read as I was uh, preparing uh, for this interview was um, I, I saw something where it mentioned detoxing from sugar. Now, how would I know if I need to detox from sugar? I mean, chances are I, I need to because I eat a lot of sugar. So <laughs> great. I just tell you right now, let's go. I'm actually doing one. I don't know when this episode is going to release, but November 1st, I'm going to do, I'm going to run a free one, a sugar detox in my million dollar body Facebook community. So if you wanted to join us there, you feel free, uh, but the, the easy way to tell if you need a detox from sugar, it goes back to exactly what I was talking about earlier is, are you getting hunger cravings at 10 30? You know, you're like, man, I had a breakfast. Like, why am I so hungry? 2 30. Are you in the fridge at nine o'clock? If so, because like what happens if, if you have like a handful of Skittles or something sugary, you're feeding the specific gut bacteria that eats sugar. And those, that bacteria has a direct line to your brain. So it can release this chemical called leptin, which is like, which is like the, or I'm sorry, ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone, which tells your body brain like, Hey, let's get some more food. And you're like, why do I need more food? It's because the sugar is sending signals to your brain. It's like, well, let's get some more sugar. I haven't had sugar in a while. So we need to starve that out. So like, I don't think that you need to detox from sugar by buying a bunch of fancy pills and powders or doing a wrap or, you know, dripping essential oils into your eyeballs or whatever it is that people do. You just need to 
drink more water, eat nutritious food, and then give your body some time away from sugar. And the way we do this is by doing a 24 hour fast after we put a ton of vital nutrients in your body. So that way you're not getting these cravings or feeling like you're crashing out all day long. So it's a really simple five day challenge that I, that I walk people through. It's uh, we're doing it the day after Halloween for obvious reasons. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. But if you've ever had that experience where you're getting tired, you're getting cravings, then you probably need to detox at some point. All right. Yeah, I will definitely uh, sign up for that because I, I know that I need to do a sugar detox. Uh, I, I ate a lot of, a lot of candy. Just it's easy. And I don't know. I love eating candy. <laughs> But at least you're honest. It's not, I know it's not good for me. So um, one of the things that I try to do to offset that is the uh, probiotics to try and uh, change my gut chemistry. Just, you know, because I know that if I'm feeding bad bacteria and I'm promoting the growth of that, I need to put better bacteria in my gut. and. Uh, probably better to just do away with the sugar <laughs> you said it not me <laughs> yeah. um so one of the things that you've said and and you've said it multiple times but this high energy is this the energy that you're producing through this uh the meals that you eat three times a day um is that what you're, you're building through this plan is, is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think about, you know, a busy professional that has that lethargic feeling, um, those cravings throughout the day. You said that there's seven. Seven daily investments? Seven daily investments, three of them being breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What are what are the other four? Um, I don't want you to give away the book, but um, happy to. All right, no secrets. Yeah. So the so number uh, well, I guess if we count those three, the other one's going to be uh, liquid assets, having a gallon of water per day. And some people are like, "What if I live in this hemisphere? What if I'm a man? What if I'm a woman? Just drink a gallon of water. You probably need more than that, but just drink a gallon. See what happens. See how you feel. Just drink a gallon. Period. What about lattice? No, just drink a gallon. And the next one is called uh, final deposit, which is taking out stuff out of your brain at night and writing down your three critical tasks for the for tomorrow. Like, what do you need to accomplish in order to consider uh, tomorrow like a, a really good day? Uh, the next one is going to be um, train for 20 minutes. And I think the distinction between training and exercising is training uh, means that you get better every single day. And then the seventh one is, so I have one, I have one that's a, uh, like a seven daily and then one that's a monthly one. So the seventh one is uh, the morning routine, which is the, Train, like drink 32 ounces of water, two big glasses of water in the morning and do 60 seconds of explosive exercise. So jumping jacks, push-ups, shadow boxing, it's gonna get you more excited, more up, to, up and going than just like having a cup of coffee. And then the one weekly investment is fast for 24 hours a week. And I think that like that's, that is critical to people's success as well. It's just a nice way of letting your body naturally detoxify itself, like giving it space to like, to let your stomach kind of shrink back to its normal proportions helping your body reconnect to like how much food does it actually need? Cause if you never stop eating and like people, like people in the U S we haven't had like a break from eating since like 1957. Like we've been eating constantly since then. No one's like, no one's that hungry. So we need to give ourselves like just some space um, for two reasons. Number one, give our body the, the ability to detox. But number two, like we just need to stop eating. We need to like take that mental break because if we're so addicted to food and to comfort into this, like this culture of like, well, I just, I just needed something, you know, then we're never going to be able to get through like actually hard scenarios. So I think it's a good physical and mental exercise to fast for 24 hours at least. I, I'd like to rewind uh, a little bit because I, I feel like who you are right now has been shaped by a lot of other things. And to 
kind of get a sense of that. And, and you talked about it for for a little bit and your your trip to South America, how much of your experience there has kind of shaped um, th this program? That's a good question. And I wouldn't say, I would say probably not, not a lot. I was like um, more so than, than like traveling there. Like when I was working as a personal trainer, like personal trainers have the weirdest hours. Like we start at like, you know, five or 6 a.m. and we go till like 8 p.m. and they have like between 11 and two, which is kind of an empty block in the middle. It's kind of like a donut, you know? And so more so than traveling, it was like my, my experience with this, like with thinking about nutrition was shaped by ridiculous work hours and working, you know, like, you know, like on being on the floor for like 12, 13, 14 hours a day. So, um, and then like my seven o'clock clients don't give a shit that I was, that I was there at 6am. They want the same energy and enthusiasm at that point that I had for my earliest clients, you know? So like no, no one's coming in and be like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited for a really exhausted, grumpy Nate. Like that's not how personal trainers make their money. So I, w I was already thinking about how you like eat for energy and what kind of foods you need to eat in order to have like the, the physique and the, like the lean body that you're looking for, but also have the energy to show up big time for clients and family. So yeah, the, the, I don't think the, uh, I don't think the traveling had as big of an impact on the nutrition and the lifestyle piece as it did maybe the training piece and the frequency piece and the, like some of those habits. So how long did you work as a personal trainer? And, and that would have been when you had your own gym and then you went to Seattle and you worked as a trainer there as well. So I'm guessing probably several years. Yeah, it's close to a decade by the time I was all, all like all done. Like I, I just finally stopped working as a person in person. I'm still have like a couple of clients that I train in person. So I guess you could technically say I've, it's been 13 years, but I stopped working at a gym in 2018. So at, at that point it was a decade. Uh, and, and I'm guessing that as a trainer, you would oftentimes get clients that would say, Hey, what kind of supplements should I be taking right now? If I want to achieve this, mm -hmm. you know, I'm taking creatine or I'm eating, you know, I've, got this protein shake that I drink every morning. Uh, you know, what would you say that supplements are a good thing? Or, you know, if you do your plan, is it something that you really just don't need the supplements? That's a good question. Um, I think supplements are a good thing. I think they're probably overrated in a lot of cases. People think that they do more than they do. You know, I think like, I think the supplement industry is, is growing right now. It's only going to get bigger because most of the, most of what they, they prescribe is based off of like bad science or pr proprietary blends, which is basically the supplement industry giving you a big middle finger and being like, don't like, don't ask us what's in this. And you're like, well, like, I just want to know. And they're like, well, it's a proprietary blend. We're not telling you. You're like, okay. Like, so like a little bit of wood chips then they're like, yeah, a little bit. Well, no, no. You know? So like, <laughs> I think the supplement industry is just generally like kind of like the, it's, the reputation is besmirched by charlatans as it were. Um, but I do think that that supplements in general can be really good. And I do include some of them in the program. Like, like, I don't know if you, how you think about whey protein. I don't even think of it as a supplement really. I think of it as kind of like a food substitute. Um, but I have everyone doing protein shakes in the morning. It's the easiest way to do it. It's fast. It's new, like, it's a great, like shot of nutrients, like nutrient density, like that you can amend and tweak to fit your, fit your needs. Um, I got some people who do creatine if they're looking to put on a little bit of muscle. I got some people who are doing like reishi mushroom powder if they need to boost their immune system and have a little bit more energy. Uh, I, I got everybody taking vitamin D. I think those are like, that's critical. And everyone's taking zinc and magnesium. Like those are like kind of my main ones that I think everyone should be doing. Whey protein, zinc, magnesium, and vitamin D. And then the rest are like, you know, kind of whatever. You want to do some mushrooms? Great. You want to do some creatine? Great. You want to do some pre-workout? Great. Like, but at that point, I don't think any of it's mandatory. And then you get into like these thermogenics and fat burners and things that like are really like towing the line of like just general bullshit. Like that's when I think that like supplement industry is doing more harm than good and promising these rapid results or help making people think that like, oh man, you know what? It's just a hack, Dave. This is like a really easy thing. All you do is just take these three pills every day. It's going to block all your carbs and you can eat like a total asshole and it's no problem. And like, that is where it like, blows my mind or Dr. Oz chilling away for like raspberry ketones, which are, have zero scientific backing, do nothing and cannot put your body into ketosis, no matter how fancy the bottle is. What would you say 
is the secret weapon for fat loss. Yeah, going back to what we talked about earlier, that month, that month, or that weekly, weekly investment of a 24 hour fast. A lot of people talk about fasting when most people, when they're like, oh, I'm fasting right now, what they're talking about is that 16 hour fast with an eight hour feeding window, intermittent fasting. I think that's largely overblown. And especially for entrepreneurs, it's not the best choice. And here's why is that when you don't eat breakfast and then you go eat lunch, your lunch is always going to be larger than it necessarily needs to be because you've been hungry all morning. So most of the time when you're eating, like when you're eating lunch, it's not like, well, I'll have two hard boiled eggs and some like, and some carrots. You're like, skip breakfast. What am I going to have? I'm going to have breakfast. And I'm also going to have lunch. And then I'm also probably gonna have a milkshake because of intermittent fasting, you know? And like, so you have these gigantic epic meals and then your afternoons are crushed, you know? So much better to do, to have a higher protein and fat breakfast in the morning, a lighter lunch to get through the afternoon and then spend 24 hours once a week fasting that prolonged fast, a 24 hour fast is basically worth three and a half, 16 hour fasts. So the longer you go, the more, the, like, the more that benefits ramp up like exponentially. So the, the longer you can fast with kind of three days being the, like the, the upper, upper limit in terms of physical benefits, five days, 10 days, people talk about that stuff. I don't know anything about that. That's more like spiritual, men, spiritual mental benefits, but for physical benefits, those, those top out at three days, 72 hours. So that would like fasting, you know, 24 to 48 hours once per week is amazing for fat loss. It's a super awesome secret weapon. It also helps hone your focus and just make you harder to kill human being. When we're talking about your book and, and you said that it's not really like an exercise regimen, right? But you do encourage the, the person to, to do that. 60 seconds of high intensity in the morning. And I, I would imagine something later on in the day as well. 20 minutes of movement every day. Yeah. And, but it's not really specific as what kind of exercises. I mean, like not, not especially. So like in the book, I'm not, I gave some examples, but I don't, I'm not giving out training plans or programs. Cause I don't know everyone's situation. That's kind of where like, if you wanted more along those lines, that's why I have the coaching program where that's like, that's where I do specific meal plans, shopping lists, supplement guides, like actual training programs and stuff like that. Um, if you want a little bit more, but basically what it is for those 20 minutes, it's, it's really basic, especially for the first four weeks. It's nothing crazy. It's just like highlighting big muscle groups, uh, making sure that you're, you're progressing every single week. So that way, if you get like three rounds in, in week one, you got to get at least three and a half rounds week two. That way you're making, you're surely making progress. And the other big thing that I like to accomplish in the first four weeks is making sure that your tendons, joints, and ligaments are all getting protected and building up strength because there's nothing worse than trying to get back in shape and then catching a shoulder injury, hurting your low back. And so a lot of guys, when they come to the program, I'm like, okay, 20 minute workouts. And they're like, that's it. No, I'm not doing anything else. Can I deadlift? I'm like, no. You can do, you can do whatever you want to at the end of four weeks, but you have to do it my way until then. And it's the people who like adhere to the program, even though they're like, this is not very much, it's too easy. I go, great. Just, just do it. Then I'll make it harder next time. Don't stress. Those people get way better results. And the people are like, can I just add in a 45 minute deadlift session? Can I go train for my triathlon afterwards? And I'm like, no, why? Like keep, keep the goal, the goal, right? You try to chase two rabbits, you catch zero, right? What is something that we we haven't really touched on, but is worth highlighting with regard to your two books and and really um, the target audience being busy professionals? And and it sounded like um, maybe you're targeting men more than women. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, generally. And like I've had a lot of women go through the program with with like you know with a lot of success and, and get a lot out of it. But what I've seen is that more, like more often, it's just um, men can resonate with the idea that, that your nutrition equals better relationship with your kids, better, more, better financial success. And then also like, if I had to put, choose to put all my marketing into one basket, I'd say I'd probably target men, dads a lot more. Okay. But one, are you asking about one aspect of something that's important here that we haven't really covered today? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that like that. I think that tactics are great. I love talking about tactics. I would love to talk to you about carbohydrates and the glycemic index. I'd love to talk to you about Bulgarian split squats and how your hip angle can impact like the the major muscle group that you're working. 
But at the end of the day, like none of that shit matters if your mind's not right. If you don't get your mind right, if you don't, if you don't set yourself up in a position where you are not accepting um, anything less than completion, than a checked box, then you're going to be, you're going to like swim in this, like this ocean. You're going to be susceptible to like, to fad diets like keto, to, to BS supplement claims. You're going to always think there's something better out there, but you, but you got to know that like the, the basics don't really change. And the, at the end of the day, you can't lose if you don't stop. You can't lose if you don't quit here. So you have a piece of, like you have a pizza on Sunday, you drink 27 White Claws, like who gives a shit? Don't worry about it. Don't blow the whole thing up just because you had a bad day or a bad weekend. You need to get right back into it and go again. Because if you stop, then you're done. If you keep going, despite like stuff that happens, stuff that comes up, then you can always, you'll, you'll always get the, the win. You're always gonna get the victory. The victory is assured to you if you don't quit. So wrapping your mind around that and becoming the type of person who's like, listen, I do what it takes to get, to get this done. This is obviously important to me. It's important to my family. It's important to my financial situation. It's important to my physique. And I will not stop until it's complete. Give me that person who doesn't know how to do a squat over the person who's been in the gym for 10 years, who's got a weak mindset, who's continually looking at like the latest fat burner. Every single day, I'll take that first person. It was interesting that you mentioned almost like a, a journal entry at night. Uh, writing three things down uh, that you want to accomplish the next day. And I, I actually am about to, uh, well, I don't know when it's going to release, but my book is uh, about building a grand strategy for your life and, and leadership development. And really, uh, you know, when you hit a wall, when you, fall flat on your face when you basically just screw up and and it seems like all of your plans have derailed really how to pick yourself up dust yourself off and and push forward and in there i talk about the importance of of journaling really to i, I guess balance the ledger at the end of the day taking a little bit of time to really write down some things that went well for you during the day and things that maybe didn't go so well uh, and really how you're going to uh, attack it in the next day. So it's very similar to what you're saying. And it's a, it's a stoic practice um, that goes back to, to ancient Greece and, and the original Stoics. Um, Marcus? Well, Marcus Aurelius, he's the, the most prolific journalist or uh, journaler. He's the one that um, you can read his, his journal entries and in, in meditations. But uh, is it Cato the, the Younger? What, I want to say it was Cato or maybe it was Seneca that, that said that you should balance the ledger at the end of the day so that your mind can can rest at night essentially yeah and, that's smart um but i i like the idea of writing down those three things that that you want to you know attack head on the next day um and I, i'm guessing you would visit that the next morning yeah just that, make sure you have like you have whatever it is in place that needs to make that happen. So whether it's like a workout, whether it's meal prep, whether it's picking your kids up or writing a contract, that way you can focus your efforts and energy on like the highest, the highest um, ROI producing like, like metrics for your, for your life. You know, if like, if getting a workout in is really the most important thing for you that next day, then making sure that it happens, getting it scheduled, picking up your kids, writing an email sequence, finishing a podcast, whatever that looks like. To make sure that you have some direction. I also think that giving your subconscious something to, to work on while you sleep is a, is a great way to, to be successful long-term and also sleep better. So you're not having to like lay awake being like, oh, what am I doing? Who do I need to talk to? I'm sure you've been there too, where you like have just like a bunch of little ticky tack things on your mind. You yeah. can't fall asleep because of that. Yeah. And how, how does your, your plan work uh, to, because you mentioned that it, it, it helps your sleep improve. Um, how, how, what's the science behind that? With, uh, with like 
writing stuff down and can't having how that helps your sleep improve? No, your your plan, your um, you know the food intake and really how you how you build your day out. And how does the how does the higher carb at night help your sleep improve? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like all day long, we want to be in what's called a sympathetic nervous system dominant state. So that's like like th people think of it as like fight or flight, but obviously there's a spectrums, right? So like it's running from a cheetah is over here, but we want to be kind of like right in the middle. Um, like I call it shake and bake, you know, we want to be like up, we want to be looking around, we want to be like focused, we want to have the mental acuity for the tasks in front of us. But then at some point we don't, that it's not serving us anymore. You know, like at 9 PM, you don't need to be like, what's happening. I'm really sharp. I'm really, I'm like good at writing stuff down. Like that's the time we're trying to transition into a nighttime rest and digest. So we use our food as a way of doing that. So with our, like, so all day long, we've been like blood sugar is really even like this. And then at nighttime, we're going to let that spike up a little bit bigger. And then let, as that comes down, that's going to help us drift off to, and get a, like a lot more deep, relaxing sleep. And then you're going to wake up feeling more rested, more recovered because of it. Awesome. Oh, man. And, and I'm guessing the, the high protein and, and all that, it, it just seems like the, the building muscle component would come later, like after you do the first 30 days, is that accurate to say? Uh, honestly, probably longer than that. Most people don't get down to their, to their 0.46, um, like waist height ratio in 30 days. And if you are, if you are there, then you didn't have a whole lot to lose anyway. So most people need, you know, between three months to six months to get to that point where they're starting to like be benefited by building their muscle metabolism. Some people start that too early where they already have too much fat on their frame. And, th and then it's harder to add lean muscle, easier to add, easier to add fat. And your body's just not as anabolic as you would be if you were a little bit leaner. Now, is there anything that we didn't touch on that, that you feel is important to leave with the listeners? No, I really feel like, I, f I really feel like, you know, with the right tactics, with the right plan and stuff, you can, you can accomplish anything you want to find someone who's done it before. And like, like get that person in your corner. So whether that's buying a book or, or going through a course or, you know, hiring a coach, whatever that looks like to find the right person to walk you through those steps. If this is something you actually desire. So like, if I wanted, if I was like, Hey, I really need to help like with my leadership stuff, getting my life back on track. Like, how do I get back up? I get kicked in the teeth. Like, I don't want to have a conversation with you about that, Dave. Like if I wanted to have like, you know, figure out more about stocks or, you know, buying a, like a landscaping company. I know there are coaches or people that can help me out with that. If I want to get in shape, I'd go to a coach. I, I have a coach that does my, uh, my, my trainings. I don't want to write it. I'm not good at writing my own programs. So I only do things that I want to do, not things that are, that are important to me. So I think that like, if you have, if you have the right mentality about this, if you know that you can just keep going and not quit, um, then get the right person in your corner to help you get the result that you're looking for. Just for the, the listeners, um, where, where is the best place for them to purchase your book? And I'm guessing, well, actually, before we started recording, you actually have quite a few websites. So what's the best website to, to get the most information? And is that the same website to get your book from? No, you can go to Amazon. Amazon's got actually a lot of books on it including mine. <laughs> so you can check it out there, go to a million dollars or just go, or you can go to n8 training systems.com to check out some more of my articles, podcasts, different things like that. My podcast is called the million dollar body podcast. Um, and if you wanted to join us in the community, it's one of like the best places on Facebook to be. It's called the million dollar body community. It's called it's n8 training systems.com slash group. We'll get you there. Uh, and what I will do is I'll put a link to your website and your social media accounts. I'll put those links in the show notes so that anybody listening can just go check it out uh, in the show notes, click a hyperlink and take you right to you. Awesome. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. It's a lot of fun to talk. Yeah, man. I, I appreciate you coming on and I, I love talking about this stuff. I, um, I actually look forward to reading your book because I think it'll help me out a lot. Awesome. So. Yeah. I'd love, love to hear what you think. All right, man. Thank you for listening to this episode of From Embers to Excellence. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on your favorite podcast platform and visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. 
My goal is, and always will be, to add value to as many people as possible. So if I can be of any assistance to you or someone you know, please connect with me via email or on one of my social media accounts, linked on the homepage of my website. Remember, our failures don't define us unless we let them, and the only true measure of a leader is the success of their team.